The next speaker received her BA from Kent State University and then her associate's degree in respiratory therapy from the University of Chicago. She's worked in respiratory therapy since 1972 and in diagnostics, the PFT lab, since 1997. She's been at MUSC since 1992. Please welcome Marilyn Henderson, who's going to talk about detection in the pulmonary lab. Marilyn? What? Here we go. Thank you all so much. Um, this is going to be very informal, but I want to explain to you why you have to do those breathing tests and what kind of things they help us understand about your lungs. Um, this presentation was an, ad an adaptation of what Dr. Strange has made at one point in time. Um, spirometry, which is your basic test. That one you have to take in the big breath and blow as hard as you possibly can until you feel you can't blow anymore. Um, this is the basic test where we all start. And it is very important that you do your best on this test. We try to meet what's called the American Thoracic Society guidelines. So that's why you might have to repeat. You might have to rest in between those trials because we need at least three trials that look alike and are within 5% of each other. So when um, the therapist says, keep blowing, keep blowing, keep blowing, and you say, God, I'm already empty, what does she want? Um, you keep pushing because there's still more air there or she wouldn't be telling you that, or he. Shouldn't be sexist here. Uh, so this is where we start. And spirometry in and of itself can do two different things. It can tell us obstruction or restriction. That's all it tells us. It doesn't tell us a disease process. It does not do a diagnosis. It just tells, can you get your air out as fast as you should be able to? Can you get as much air out as you should be able to? Uh, so some of the things we do, we look for at least a six second expiratory time. Now most of you, if you have obstructed lungs, can blow out for 15, 16 seconds. And we're still going, oh, keep blowing, keep blowing. And some of you are so short of breath that you're lucky to get the six seconds, through the six seconds. Um, always use a nose clip, and we always have you sitting. Used to have people stand till we had a few pass out on us. So now it's sitting. And as I said about the three tests. Now this is a basic time volume curve. And you see the um, six seconds across the bottom and the uh, volume across the top. Um, the yellow line is a pretty much a normal looking volume time curve. And the mark there for the first second, that's your FEV1, which you've probably heard of a lot about. That's forced expiratory volume in the first second. And the FVC, which is how much air do you get out, your forced vital capacity. So those are the two measurements that are most important off spirometry. How much air can you get out? FVC. How much do you get out in the first second? FEV1. And we like those two numbers to top. They're t usually the top numbers on your uh, report to agree within that 5% of each other. Now, these are the different things that affect your spirometry reference values. Um, you're being compared to someone your age, your height, your race, and your sex because Males and females obviously have different sized lungs. People of different heights have different sized lungs, etc. So those are the four things that affect your reference values for your spirometry. A normal spirometry, that FVC, the amount of air you're able to blow out, should be at least 80% of your reference value. And your FEV1 should be at least 80% of your reference value. And then the 2575, this isn't talked about too much. It's forced expiratory flow. And 2575 means your mid-flow. And what this measures, it measures your smaller airways emptying. Your FEV1, how much air can you blast out to start with? That's your larger airways, and that's your muscles. You know, you can, you can really blow out that first part of your air really hard and fast. But then as you keep blowing, and that's where the therapist has to coach you, keep pushing, keep pushing. Because as your smaller airways empty, you don't feel it anymore. It's still coming out, but you can't feel it being measured. 
So the initial blast is your larger airways, the air that you come out later with are your smaller airways. And the importance of pushing all the air out until you're empty is to give us this mid-flow. Because if you get so short of breath, you can't blow out all your air. And I agree, it takes a while. But we need to know, if you have enough time, if you can keep blowing, can you eventually at least get your FVC normal? And the majority of you can, unless you also have another problem going on besides just obstruction. These are some of the diseases, and you know alpha-1 falls under your COPD, and bronchiectasis falls in there. So these are some of the diseases that can cause obstructive lungs. Now, there could be others, but these are the more common ones we'll see. Now, these numbers are a little hard to uh, see, but don't worry too much about that. It's how you classify the obstruction. Is it mild, moderate, severe, very severe? And if you have restriction, is it mild, moderate, or severe? Um, so as I said, if your FVC is over 80, that's normal. If it's less than 80, then we start talking about um, having a restriction or obstruction. If your FVV1 is less than 80, then we start looking more at obstruction. And when we were doing the um, Alpha-1 study at MUSC, the American Association of Respiratory Care and the Alpha-1 Foundation co-sponsored uh, co this study. And um, some of you in this room, even, at least one person I know, was uh, picked up on this study um, as having one of the genotypes. What we did was if somebody's PFT showed that their FEV1, that amount they'd get out in that first second, was less than 80, which would be abnormal, and if their ratio was below 70, then that showed obstruction enough to at least be tested for alpha-1. Now, a therapist who's doing a person's PFT for the first time, we usually go through a little history. We ask you about your smoking history. We ask you about um, your cough. Um, we ask you about your shortness of breath, things like that. Well, when we have somebody who says they never smoked, and they're 30s, 40s, and 50s, and we see these numbers being low, that sends up a yellow flag to us. And when we were doing the study, that meant, uh-uh, better test them. And we still do um, try to test people. We've, most of our regular patients we've already tested if they fit in this uh, classification. Um, so this is where the therapist really helped with um, finding a lot of the genotypes out there. In, as Dr. Strange was talking earlier, there was um, an idea of trying to find out how many people in the general population carry any of these genotypes, whether carriers or ZZs. And as you know, some ZZs don't show any symptoms, and some, of course, are terrible. Um, so just how many out there in the general population? And probably 95% of the people we asked to participate did. And it was all kept confidential, as Dr. Strange said. Um, the results are kept in a database there at MUSC. And the patient is notified by a letter or a phone call saying, this is what you are. And the big advantage of it is if, you know, there's the prolastin, the infusion out there that you can start that helps prevent your disease from getting worse. And also there's the idea, since this is inherited, do any of my children, grandchildren, brothers, sisters, whatever, need to be tested too? Because, gee, my grandkids seem to have asthma. Well, is it asthma? As you all know, you were often diagnosed with asthma before anything else. So if you can catch it earlier, and it's very easy. As you know, if you've been tested, it's a prick of your finger. You get three drops of blood, and it's sent in to be uh, checked. All right, getting back to the spirometry a little more. The white line is a normal flow volume loop. That's um, one of the most common things you'll see on a uh, PFT report, your flow volume loop. The white one is totally normal. The yellow shows some obstruction. You don't have to worry about what numbers go along with it. It just shows you when you're on top of the horizontal line that you're blowing out. When you're below it, that you're in breathing in. So that's why we encourage you to breathe back in good, too. Um, this tells the physician a lot of different things. And when you become, become obstructed, you become more like the yellow line. 
And the more obstructed you are, the more what we call scooping of that yellow line. You see the yellow line has kind of a crescent shape? Well, the worse you get, the more the crescent. <laughs> and so um, just looking at a um, flow volume loop can give us a lot of information. Now this is the other side of the coin. This is restriction. The person is able to blast out that air in that first second, but they can't get out as much air as they should be able to. And there are different diseases that can cause restriction. Um, and some of you may have a combination. That's not uncommon. But so that would be a strict restricted loop. And this, don't worry about all the abbreviations there. You know, it's medical. We like to use abbreviations. But what is good about this slide is, if I can work this here, this first part, this up and down, up and down, then over here, up and down, that's just your normal breathing. And it's TV, it's tidal volume. Tidal meaning like the tide, in and out, in and out, in and out. And so we look for that when we're doing your test. We look for you to get kind of a baseline of tidal breathing. And then we have you take in your biggest breath possible and blow it all out down to this point, And then you go back to your tidal breathing. So the, from the top to the bottom, from up here to down here, that's your vital capacity. There's two kinds of vital capacities. There's forced and there's slow. But when you do most often is the forced. Because, like I said, to find obstruction, you have to see how fast you get your air out. And um, sometimes when you're doing other tests, like your diffusion capacities or your lung volume measurements, you're going to do what's called a slow vital capacity. You don't have to do speed on that. You don't have to blow hard. And sometimes, if you're really obstructed, you're going to get a bigger number on that one because you aren't forcing your air. And as Dr. Strange showed you on some of his um, CTs and x-rays, with um, emphysema, with COPD, you get that air in pretty easy. It gets trapped in there. And that's a pretty common term that you may have heard. It gets trapped. You have a hard time getting it out. When you have an exacerbation, you either also have some mucus buildup from infection, or maybe your airways have closed down a little bit, got a little constricted. He showed some of those. So that the air has even more trouble coming out. And that's where it takes you a long time to get it out. So if you aren't doing a force, you're doing a slow, you can more comfortably breathe more air. Now, when you get short of breath, if you're an alpha and you have lung problems, you know when you start panicking, what happens? Pretty soon, you aren't getting enough air in. Because what's happening? You're taking in that air, and it's building up in there, but you aren't taking long enough for it to come back out. How many of you have heard of pursed lip breathing? Good. Because <laughs> that's what you need to do. Pursed lip keeps those airways open longer so that, that air can come out. It doesn't let them shut down like you do on a forced. So it's hard. You've got to train yourself to do it. When you're having a little anxiety and you're getting short of breath, slow yourself down, in through your nose, out through your mouth. Keep those airways open longer so you don't trap so much air in there. And when we do a lung volume measurement, this RV, whoops, wrong thing, um, pointer. <laughs> RV down here where it, you can't breathe. That RV, that's the amount of air left in your lungs after you've pushed everything out. We can't push all the air out or we'd collapse our lungs every breath. So that's your RV. That's your residual volume. And it's, like I said, you don't have to worry about those terms, but that's the air in there you can't push out. The ERV, which is right here, it's the amount of air after you've breathed out till you breathe all of it out. Now, if you're sitting there and you're taking a breath in and out, breathe out, normal. Then, after you've breathed out, go ahead and go. See how much more air comes out? You feel that? That's your reserve volume. Like, if you have to, you can still push more air out. But it's not normally pushed out. So we measure those when we do lung volume measurements. And I think that should be the next slide. How many of you have sat in the body box? <laughs> it's supposed to be called a plethysmograph because body box doesn't sound good. But it's a chamber where you sit in and you do some measurements. And in that box, what we're doing, we're measuring that amount of air in your lungs that you can't breathe out. And when you are trapping air, that volume is going to be higher than it should be. 
And also, um, as Dr. Strange said, when you are obese, you can see, let me get this pointer here, this lady is not, so she doesn't have weight pushing up on her lungs. If you're overweight and you're sitting down, that weight is pushing up on your lungs. Your stomach is pushing up on your lungs, so you can't take in as big a breath as you like. So your reserve volume, expiratory reserve volume, is going to be smaller. And the air trapped in there could be larger. Okay. So that's what the body box does. It measures that gas that's in your lungs that you can't breathe out. We can also do it by the uh, helium dilution or nitrogen washout. And these two methods are um, preferable for most of us because you only have to do it once. And if you given enough time, even if you're very obstructed, you will equilibrate. The body box, you have to do at least three times. And you have to be able to sit in that box and not get claustrophobic. So um, we have to use the box when the doctor requests it and for a lot of research. And if we're having trouble getting a nitrogen washout volume measurement, we'll put somebody in the box. Um, so going on, this has got to cut a couple examples. Um, this is actually a patient we had the other day, his numbers. And um, if you look at the FVC, remember I said that's the amount of air you're able to blow out when you push all the air you poss possibly can. Now this person, this is the actual, this is how much air they blew out. They were expected to blow this much out. Okay, you look at percentage of air expected versus what they did was only 37%. So this person has a lot of restriction also. They aren't able to get that air out. Then you look at that FEV1, how much air do you get out in that first second when you blow the hardest you can? And they got 40% out. So the ratio isn't too bad. The ratio of these two numbers, like I said, if it's below 70, it's abnormal. Well, this one's 69. So that's not too bad. But they've got something else going on, too, because of that restriction. Then on lung volume measurement, you see you, you can verify this restriction. Their total lung capacity is only 50% of what it should be. But let's go down, look at the patient's residual volume. Remember I said that air in there you can't push out? It's 77%. Well, none of those other percents are that high. So they have more air in their lungs that can't come out than they have in all the other parts of the lung. And one important measurement from like lung volume measurements is this ratio, that air left in your lungs compared to the total amount of your lungs. And you see this person was 154%. You don't want that number to be high. You don't want it to be over 100%. Because that means you've got air trapped. And the next one, next slide, let's see. Whoops, wrong way. It did turn over. This, this is a woman, COPD, and you see smokes. Uh, the spirometry test showed an actual blowing out the air to the predicted 51%. I apologize. I did not really get, I didn't realize this, get a good example of um, our normal obstructed patient. Because normally our obstructed patient still has a good actual FVC. Usually they're 80s, 90s percents here, like I said, normal. I happen to get somebody who's also restricted here. But this is even worse. The amount of air they blew out in that first second is not is barely a half liter. And it's only 27 percent. And the ratio isn't bad, though. Well, I'm sorry. It is bad. <laughs> it's 40 percent. But they're, uh, they don't have a lot of air to move around anyway. But then we go and do a lung volume measurement. And their actual is way over what's even predicted, 121%. You think, oh, total lung capacity. I've got great total lung capacity. But where is that total lung capacity? That it's made up between this ERV and the RV, these two numbers. See that the amount of air trapped in there? Almost twice what's expected. So that person has a big, full, round chest with old, stale air in there that's not doing them much good. And this is one reason a lot of you get short of breath. 
like Dr. Strange said about the holes in your lungs, because when the air goes in those big holes, it doesn't have the elasticity to come back out. So it stays in there and keeps um, getting the carbon dioxide put into it and the oxygen drained out of it. You can only have so much of that, and that makes you short of breath. So a lot of you will use extra oxygen just to help with that. All right, I don't know. I think I used up about my time. Maybe a couple questions. Hold on. There. <clears throat> The question I have, uh, and I don't have alpha-1, normal breathing, uh, you exhale less than your capacity. Mm -hmm. What happens to the difference between normal breathing and maximum exhalation? Does that air simply stay in the lungs and never get circulated? No, if, you're, um, if your lungs are normal, the air is slowly diffusing around in your lungs. So what goes in on this breath, part of it comes out on that breath. But the part that stayed in there might come out on the next breath. It's revolving. Okay? Some new fresh air is getting in there all the time, and some of that old stale air is going out. And every once in a while, you'll notice, ah, I took a big sigh. Why did I do that? You don't even notice it half the time. But we sigh every so often, and we use that extra. Mm hmm Okay. Any other questions? Okay, Chris. This will be our last one and then we'll move on. We hear a lot of, a lot of about the term diffusion, but we don't talk a lot about the diffusion number. What is the importance of that number in relation to daily activities and the way we breathe? Well, it's very important related to your daily activities. I, I didn't do too much on the slides about it because I didn't have a whole lot of time and I can talk forever. But um, your diffusion capacity is how well that oxygen you're breathing in gets across your lungs into your blood. So that's the main purpose of our lungs. Let's get the air in, get that oxygen to our bodies in the cells for the metabolism. Let's get the carbon dioxide out. Well, if you've got a lot of blebs, those holes in your lungs, where you don't have the good alveoli, you've got instead of a bunch of little alveoli, you've got maybe one big one in each place. You don't have a lot of place for that oxygen to go across the lung tissue into your blood. So if you don't have that diffusion going across, that's what we're measuring, the diffusion capacity. If you don't have that going across, you're going to get short of breath. And after a while, your heart starts beating harder because that's what your body does when you aren't getting enough oxygen then you, it can lead to a lot of other things. So that's why you want to wear your oxygen, ladies and men, who say, I just don't like to take it out. But it's harder on your heart. It's harder on your other organs because you're not metabolizing like you should be and your heart's working harder.